Hi and welcome back to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly Q&A show. You send your questions in and hopefully we get to answer them. Questions you can fire into the email address on the screen there. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and also you can add them in the comments below this very video. So first up is a tire clearance related question from Jack Beams. Ask GMBN Tech, what would you say is the minimum clearance that I should allow for on either side of the tire um, on the fork or the rear of the bike? Um, I'd probably say minimum, you wanna have about five millimeters all the way around. Of course, the more clearance you can have, the better because of the nature of mountain biking. You could be riding in mud, which is gonna clog up. You could get stones and trail debris stuck in your tire tread, which is gonna foul on the frame, can scratch it, all that sort of stuff. But something you also need to factor in is how stiff your wheels are and how stiff the frame is. Now, even though wheels do feel stiff, they can still flex quite a lot under hard loads. So if you're a heavy rider or you're heavy on the bike in the way that you ride, maybe you like to stuff it into those turns, you're gonna be quite surprised by the amount of flex that a rear wheel can have, even if it feels very stiff. And under a lot of flex, it can lead your tire to buzzing on your frame, which of course is A, gonna slow you down, B, it's gonna wear out the paintwork on your frame. Now the same thing can apply to a bike that's got more flex than one that hasn't. So just check those sort of things, if there's any telltale signs of any tire rub on your bike. And if that's the case, then you definitely wanna go for a slightly smaller tire. But rule of thumb, I reckon five mil is okay. I wouldn't wanna have it any closer than that myself. Okay, so a good old oval chainring pros and cons one here. So Emil Jensen wants to know, I'm riding a 36 tooth regular chainring, um, but I have been told that an oval chainring is good. Can you please help me with pros and cons? Okay, so I actually haven't ridden any of the new breed of oval chainrings, or certainly not spent enough time on them to really give you the best bit of feedback. So that's something I need to change soon, and I can feel a video coming on. But just for the average sort of pros and cons of what you can expect from an oval chainring. So first up, they kind of maximize on your power output. So you could argue that they give a better efficiency for your pedal stroke. Now that is assuming that your pedal stroke isn't a perfect stroke. I mean, there's not many people out there that will have a perfect pedal stroke. So arguably most people could benefit from this. Now you could say that they also will increase traction by sort of smoothing out the way that you pedal. So if you've got an erratic way of pedaling, you might find that you stab at those pedals somewhat, in which case the torque of that is gonna help the tire break loose. Now due to the way an oval chainring works, you can maximize on the traction on offer by smoothing out that sort of way that you apply the power to the back wheel. Again, so if you're very good at spinning a smooth round circle, it's not actually round, but if you're good at doing that, then you might not notice the benefits, but equally, it's gonna be very beneficial if you're not so good at that. I've heard that they're very good for people with flat pedals because it's a lot harder to have an equal sort of pedaling base when you're pedaling. And some of the cons, okay, so I've written myself a bit of a list here to remind myself. So the first up, um, it's probably a bit of a negligible difference. If they were that good, surely everyone would be using them. That's just my speculation because I don't use them. I've never felt the need to use them, but equally I definitely want to try them. So I think I'm on a similar, I'm kind of on the fence with you here, probably. Another con is the fact that with oval chain rings, um, you're gonna be a bit limited in chain guides. Now, of course, People like um, Absolute Black make narrow wide oval chain rings, so that does get around a lot of the necessity for having a chain guide. But as you might notice, a lot of cross country, a lot of XCO, a lot of enduro riders are still running an upper chain guide just as an extra form of protection, just to stop that chain hopping off. And that does become a little bit harder with an oval chain ring. Now there are a few specific ones out there, like Absolute Black do make one, that's one on the screen right there. Um, but you're very limited in the market for those. And now the final one is I've heard from some of you guys actually commenting that you think that oval chainrings actually affect and can wear out the clutch mechanism on the derailleur. Now it kind of it kind of does make sense if you think what the chainring is doing, the chain is actually sort of stretching slightly as it's going along so you're actually actuating that clutch. Now, I wasn't sure about this, so I actually asked someone at SRAM, just have you had this on your radar at all? And they said, we don't have anything on our radar about clutches creaking or wearing with this sort of use. In theory, the damping mechanism will be activated slightly more cycles when using um, an oval chain ring, but this hasn't affected anything to date. 
Uh, next up is that good old fork length question. It always comes up, a little bit different, a bit more specific though. So from a Reynold Pader, he says, hey Doddy, is axle to crown more important when picking a fork than the suspension travel itself? I ask this because when I'm trying to pick a fork for my bike without drastically changing the geometry, it came with an 80 millimeter Suntour XCT with a 475 fork length. I, I assume this is axle to crown. Yeah, generally the length that's quoted when measuring forks is that axle to crown measurement. So yeah, you're right there. I found that the RockShox 30 Gold with 100 millimeters of travel has a 488 axle to crown length. Will that negatively impact the bike or should I go with the 80 mil RockShox with a 468, uh, which of course is slightly shorter than the 475 that you've actually quoted there. Um, so yeah, I think actually most of the time fork travel sort of correlates to axle to crown, but you do get anomalies in there. And I'd say axle to crown is quite important, especially on bikes with slightly less travel because it can be more affected by altering that travel. Now, roughly for every 10 millimeters of travel, there's about half a degree in a head angle um, difference in that. So it is affected by how long the wheelbase of the bike is and a few other features, but generally you're talking about half half degree. And in your case here, talking about the, um, the 488 over the 475, that's quite a lot. You know, you're talking nearly like a, a full degree there. So you have to decide if you want to actually have that effect on the bike. Um, personally, I don't think a degree is too much to be worried about, but if you've got quite a steep head angle, it's very noticeable. And as well as actually adjusting the head angle of the bike, be it steeper or shallower, depending if it's a shorter or longer option, it also raises and lowers the bottom bracket and steepens or shallows the seat angle as well. Now that might sound a bit negligible to you, but the bottom bracket height can be noticed quite a lot, even if it is a few millimeters, because it really does affect your position on the bike, how far you feel like you sit into it and you're above the sort of uh, the fulcrum of your bike. And again, with the seat angle under climbing when you're seated, you'll notice it if it slackens it because you'll need to, you'll feel the need to sit further forwards on the saddle. And quite often you might want to run your saddle further forwards and slightly nose down to compensate if you are slackening that head angle. Um, I don't think it's that much of a problem on your particular bike. Um, so you said 80 mil rock shocks with a 468. So it's going to steepen it very slightly. Uh, but the 30 gold with 100 mil has 488. It's not going to be too bad. If you also factor in is the 30% sag that you typically set a bike up with. Obviously, if it's got more travel, it's going to have slightly more sag in relation and you're actually going to bring those numbers back closer again. So it all depends. If you can put up with it in climbing where you're naturally going to be slightly a slightly slacker seat angle, I think you'll probably be all right with that 100 mil fork. Oh, this is a good one from Dan D, a chain line friction question. Uh, loving the tech channel, Doddy. Um, I want to ask a tech question about one by drivetrains. I've heard that the one by chainring sits so close to the frame that when you're in your smallest sprocket out back, it throws the chain line off and causes extra friction, uh, in turn causing a loss in power. What are your thoughts? Um, well, firstly, it doesn't sit that close to the frame. It's sat basically to give it the best chain line through all the gear. So it sits about halfway through the cassette, so it's not too extreme on either side. Now, as long as you've got your chain line correct, actually, I don't think there is that much friction in there. However, there is always going to be more friction on the smaller sprockets than on the high friction, regardless of the derailleur here for a second. If you think about the chain just wrapping around a sprocket, when it wraps around a bigger sprocket, it's not as much wrap, so there's less friction in the chain. When it's wrapping around a smaller sprocket and it's almost all the way around it, the chain has to move a lot more. So each chain link is doing more, so there is naturally going to be slightly more friction. But in honesty, I'd actually need to put it on a machine to feel the difference because I don't think a rider can feel the difference between that and running it halfway up the transmission, regardless of the actual gear that you're in. I just don't think it's that possible on a mountain bike when there's so many other factors in there, like the tire pressure you run, the suspension you're running, how much grease you may or may not have in your bearings, the surface you're riding on. Like if you're riding on grass, obviously it's pretty a lot of friction, quite tiring compared to riding on tarmac. Um, I would actually really like to try some sort of friction-based testing and spend a couple of days just trying a whole number of different situations out on the trail and find out for real. But I don't think in this case that you can actually notice that. Um, if it was, you wouldn't see so many companies dedicate themselves to one by transmission. And especially with that new Shimano XTR transmission, we've got a video dropping, a bit of a geek edition, looking at all the facts and figures to do with that. And it's pretty impressive stuff. And you know what Shimano are like? I really can't believe they'd get involved with a little Tem tooth if they didn't think it was worth it and it had additional friction. So shifting issues from New Zealand or NZ mountain bike. Um, 
GMB and Tech, I've got a Trek Roscoe 8 with a SRAM NX 1x11 and in the middle range of gears it won't always shift and when it does shift it skips gears. At the lower and upper range of gears it shifts fine. How can I fix it? Um, Alright, so firstly you just need to identify what the problems are and with gear shifting if you've got issues, firstly do a visual inspection. Actually check those sprockets, check your chain, make sure there's no sort of stiff links or any damage with a, a link that's maybe split and it could break. Then you want to look at the alignment of your derailleur. So obviously you want to make sure it works smoothly. The cable is working smoothly inside the outer housing. So if there's any sort of unwanted friction or any gunk inside there, it's going to cause the cable to stick and it's never going to shift correctly. But in theory, if you have your limit screw set correctly, i.e. the lower limit screw for the bigger sprocket and the higher limit screw for the smaller sprocket and the derailleur it completely correlates to those, then in theory the only thing you need to do is to out your cable tension with a barrel adjuster to get perfect shifting. If yours is suffering, it's going to be out of alignment or it's going to be suffering from stickiness somewhere. So you just need to factor all those in. I'm just going to throw you quickly to some clips from a perfecting your shifting video. The link to that is going to be in the description below this video and that will answer all of those individual things. So I promise you, if you run through all of those, you will find your issue, even if you think that it's working well at either end at the moment. Good luck with that. Uh, Whistler bike has got some 10 to seven speed problems. Got a question about setting up a 10 speed to seven speed. I have an Atomlab DHR rear hub and it only fits seven cogs. So I took a Shimano Altegra 6700 road cassette and removed three cogs. My question is shift to setup. I don't like having three dead shifts within there obviously because it's uh, designed for 10 speed rather than 7. Um, can I modify my Saint shifter to make it 7 speed or have I seen a block that fits on the cable to limit the shift cable movement? Um, I don't think so, I've not seen it, although saying that it sounds like it's something that should exist. The only thing I've seen for shifter modifications from E13 to modify your 11 speed shifter to take 12 speed shifting uh, and that is by including a, a proper ratchet you actually take apart your shifter and put that inside in place of the 11 speed one to give yourself the extra click. Um, I've not heard of something to convert a 10 speed or any other shifter backwards down to a 7. Um, the new XTR has it from 12 to 11 but it's only compatible with 12 speed uh, just for taking off the extra there. Um, no, I don't think so, but I'd love to know if there is something out there that does exist, because if it does, we'll look at doing a video on how to hack a drivetrain like that. Uh, in the meantime, I'll try and find out, but I don't think so. I think you're going to have to put up those extra clicks, unfortunately. Okay, so next one is Bike Fit uh, from Andy Genther. Dolly, I'm impressed and amazed with how thorough and articulate you are. Um, it's just research, mate, and the fact I'm a bit of a bike geek. I love this stuff. Um, excellent work, my man. I'm currently riding an 09 Nomad size medium. I'm hoping to upgrade soon. I've struggled finding a stable body position, especially downhill due to small reach. Um, yeah, it's always a big problem, especially for taller riders. Uh, I have my eye on a new Nomad size large. I'm 5 foot 10 and like a short stem. Uh, any thoughts on bike size or ways to find my triangle ratio? Uh, I love the fact you say that because I do completely believe in that basically is the argument for getting the ultimate bike fit. Um, I had a look online at the 09 one versus uh, the current one. Uh, so the one in the office that we have for bike build is a size large. So the reach on the size large now is 460 and it's got a 690 top tube. And on your 09 one, it's 405 and 609, so it's absolutely tiny by comparison. So no wonder you're struggling. So at 510, I mean, Santa Cruz recommend a size large anyway for your fit. So I think that's a no-brainer because it is a nice roomy bike. You'll be able to put a 30, 40 mil stem on there. You're going to get that nice roomy cockpit, all the control that you want, aggressive geometry. I mean, you know already if you look at a Nomad, you know what you're dealing with there. I always tell people to size up on bikes if they can, or at least try and pick the right size as opposed to picking a smaller size in the theory that you're going to be able to throw it around because all that's going to happen is, yeah, all right, if you're really into jumping, a small bike can be very beneficial, but if you want to go fast off-road, a nice long bike that you sit into the frame properly is always going to be better than a short wheelbase bike that doesn't fit you where your weight, weight is all up top and a bit weeble wobble. It's almost like a big pendulum that wants to take you off the bike. And accordingly, you're leaning too far back and too, too far forwards the entire time to get that balance. Definitely go for the large. Um, I would still try and get a demo on it if I was you though. Um, but good luck and hope you enjoy it. So there's another Q&A session in the bag. Hopefully that's answered some questions. If you've got any, um, add them in the comments below or fire them into the email address at the beginning of the show. 
For a couple more tech related videos, click down the bottom there for the bike fit one. So this is answering a lot of problems that a lot of you ask all the time about having hand pain when riding, not being able to manual, all that sort of stuff. So click down there and hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of how to set your bike up and to understand the effects of what those things do to other things on the bike. And if you wanna find out a bit about what a chain does to actually affect suspension, click up here where Neil basically set up an idler wheel system on his bike so the chain passes over it to see how the bike felt with isolated suspension. Pretty tech, pretty geeky. Um, we've all known that people have been using this sort of stuff a while, but Neil's put it to test. It's quite cool. So um, as always, click on the round globe to subscribe to the channel because we've got new content for you every single week here at GMBN Tech. We love having you around. And if you like asking questions about tech, give us a thumbs up.